I would like to introduce you to Trish Johnson, who is today's present presenter. Uh, Trish took up the high profile role of bridge master of the Clifton Suspension Bridge five years ago. Uh, this role covers all the major projects involved with the bridge, as well as the maintenance and managing uh, their business, including the visitor center and the engagement with the public and trustees. Um, so Trish, uh, I might hand it over to you now uh, to give your presentation. Okay, thanks, Philip. Uh, can you hear me okay? You can indeed, yes. Okay, Thank good. You. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I hope you find this of interest. Um, as you note from the accent, um, hopefully it's not gone too anglified. I'm from County, County Down. And my family still live in, um, in Banbridge there, so I'm sure some of you know there. I came over to the mainland, as they say, to study civil engineering at Salford University many years ago, um, and like many, never returned. So, um, but less about me, this is all about the bridge. So the bridge is the center of, in the center of Bristol, and if you haven't visited before, I would definitely um, uh, strongly recommend it. Um, it's a... Uh, the bridge spans the Avon Gorge Hotel, Avon Gorge, um, the River Avon in Bristol, um, in South West England. It links two counties, and that also is difficult when um, seeking approvals or planning permission. Um, it's a chain supported bridge, a historic structure, and it's Grade One listed. And it's a private bridge. It's owned and maintained by the Clifton Suspension Bridge Trust, and there are. Um, it's an act um, that they, their aim is to maintain it into perpetuity, so no pressure for me on that at all. Um, it's a working bridge, it's part of the Bristol Infrastructure Network and carries probably around 9,000 to 10,000 vehicles a day. Um, the bridge is also tolled, um, a pound each way, um, and that toll is used solely for the maintenance and preservation of the bridge. And we don't get any other income from government or from local authorities to maintain the bridge. So basically, the toll is what we, um, are you, what we need to, to keep it going. So, so today, um, I'm just going to take you through the history of the bridge. Um, about how it was constructed and then go through the inspection, maintenance and monitoring that's carried out on the bridge um, today. And then to finish, I'll just give you a bit of an update on the major projects that have been carried out over the last few years and the, and the ongoing projects. So first, let me take you back to the 1700s, and that's when it all started. Um, Bristol derives its name from Grigstow, which means the place of the bridge. Um, but this wasn't the Clifton Suspension Bridge, but the Bristol Bridge, which um, is still called that today. And that was the only crossing point um, across the River Avon in Bristol. Um, and even then, <laughs> the traffic congestion was a problem. A new bridge was built in 1768, um, but the traffic continued to worsen. Um, and this was also a toll bridge, which didn't go down very um, well with the uh, locals, and it led to riots. There was a, a wealthy wine merchant called William Vick, who lived in the heart of this crowded city and he died in 1754. Um, and we're not really sure if William Vick was a dreamer or a forward thinker, but in his will, he left us, he left 1,000 pounds, which is about a quarter of a million in today's money to the Society of Merchant Ventures with the instruction that the money should be invested until it reached 10,000 pounds. And then this sum he believed was sufficient to build a toll-free stone bridge across the River um, Avon from Clifton to Lee Down. Um, in 1754, the technology wouldn't have been there um, to make that a reality. Stone and timber were the only construction materials and the use of iron was really in its infancy. Um, but the terms of Vic's will caused as much amusement as surprise, but I think probably Vic got the last laugh because over a century later, his dream did come true. And, uh, but it was not an easy process. About 40 years when after Vic's death, <clears throat> plans for the bridge were revived, but much had changed in this time. Bristol's shipping and the industries were flourishing now, and there was a house building boom it had begun, especially in Clifton on one side of the bridge. And in 1793, plans for a monumental stone bid, bid bridge by the aptly named William Bridges uh, were published. And this was to be a spectacular arch bridge um, a spectacular entrance into Bristol from the sea, and the construction was to include factories, a school, libraries, and lifts. 
And the plan was that the industries in the abutments would actually provide employment and the rents would pay for the infrastructure and the structure. His architectural style was seen as old fashioned and the project was badly timed because days after the design was published, war broke out with France, the building boom collapsed and the shipping trade was badly affected and the bridge never took place. So time passed and technology advanced and now we're into the 1800s and iron was beginning to be used in construction bridges. In 1820, Samuel Brown built the first iron chain suspension bridge for vehicles in Europe at Berwick and Tweed, linking England to Scotland. And that's the Union Bridge, which was far cheaper than stone and took less than a year to build. The people of Bristol were pressing, as they always do, the Merchant Ventures for a bridge. And in 1829, the Merchant Ventures acted by obtaining an Act of Parliament to change Vicksville um, so that it would actually have a toll free, so they could change it from a toll free stone bridge. The money had grown now to about £8,000, so they felt it was time for a competition. And this was a competition for an iron suspension bridge at Clifton. And there was no pressure whatsoever, but the, com the competitors had seven weeks to design the highest and longest suspension bridge in the world. Um, it was believed there were 22 entries with cost estimates ranging from 30,000 to 90,000. And four entries were received from then the 23 year old Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He was, he was keen to establish a reputation for himself after being apprenticed to his father, Mark Brunel. Um, and this shows one of Brunel's designs with the chains anchored directly into the rock. Um, and so trying to save some uh, money in terms of uh, abutments and towers. But the committee rejected all but five of the designs, um, but they felt they didn't have the experience to decide which was the best in terms of engineering. So they called the well-known father of civil engineering, Thomas Telford, to advise. Now, he judged that none of these five designs were, were suitable. And so the committee were left with only one solution um, to ask Telford himself to produce a design, which um, he you know, did. Um, in three weeks so it was a nice little job for him and his design was a, a short span suspension bridge supported by two sort of massive hollow masonry gothic style towers he kept the span, the span small because he'd had problems previously with his larger span Manai bridge and um, so the span on this was 110 meters and the cost was estimated at about 42,000. The committee were delighted. They attached the design to the parliamentary bill to change Vic's request and obtain permission to raise funds for a public work. Um, but like all good projects, it all kicked off. Um, the public didn't like tell because he had a footway right down the middle of the bridge. So that actually stopped the enjoyment of the beautiful scenery. They reckoned local talent had been ignored. No budget had been set. Um, and some designs were coming in uh, with cheaper variations and Brunel himself also circulated a new proposal which was supported by the local press. All the usual issues, things never change. And then to top it all, um, King George died and election fever uh, broke out. So once elections were out of the way, the committee again decided to hold a second design competition. So they learned from their mistakes. So they invited some of the previous entrants, but they also decided, invited some local designers. Uh, Telford and I had to have an equal footing. So he was on the, on the, um, the list as well, as was Brunel. So 13 designs were submitted and the designers were judged strictly on engineering qualities. And this time the judge was not a professional engineer, but Davis Gilbert MP, who was a widely respected mathematician and theorist on suspension bridge designs. He was minded to support um, to appoint Smith and Hawks as the winner, but then the night before he had dinner with Brunel, no doubt debating detailed calculations and designs and drawings. And the next morning he reversed his decision and proposed Brunel as the winner to the competition. So this is Brunel's initial design and he was asked to make some adjustments to it. He needed to limit the span to two, 214 meters. And that was, that was through the costly compromise of a large abutment on the Lee Woods side, which you can see there on the left-hand side of the picture. So in the end, Brunel eventually triumphed with his design endorsed by the committee. 
and he, his Egyptian architectural style was approved. So you can see sphinxes on both of the towers. Um, and the towers were to be decorated with illustrations of every stages of the construction. So clearing the land um, on the Clifton side started in uh, June 1831, but this was short-lived as four months later, the worst riots in the 19th century erupted in Bristol and work came to a standstill until five years later. Funds, funds were tight and there was a shortfall in the budget. So to attract interest in the project, a, a spectacular foundation ceremony was held on the 27th of August, 1836. There were fireworks, bands, cannons, firing salutes, boats and crowds and crowds of people. It's just a usual uh, Bristol event really from, from, from what I understand. A time capsule was placed in the rock containing coins, the Act of Parliament and a China plate and work went, got underway. It was a slow process. Work started on the Lee Woods abutment in spite of insufficient funds. And gradually the, two, the massive two-story uh, abutment took place and the huge vaulted chambers were built of gray pennant rubble stone and faced with dressed arsenal blocks of old red sandstone. Sadly, bankruptcy and harsh weather took its toll on the project. And in 1843, the towers and abutments were constructed but the money had run out and the ironwork that had been bought for the chains had unfortunately had to be sold off to pay off the debts. And you might be familiar with this bridge. They were, the chain links were actually sold on to Brunel's Royal Albert Bridge at Saltash near Plymouth. And the land then was returned to the Society of Merchant Ventures and it being understood that the idea of completing the bridge was now wholly, um, wholly abandoned. So Brunel died, um, aged just 53, in 1859, and with the bridge not built. And ironically, his death was the incentive to actually complete the bridge. And the following year, a fellow engineer, John Hawkshaw, who was president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, when taking down the Hungerford Bridge, which was a footbridge that had been built by Brunel uh, between 1841 and 1845, he realized that those chains could actually be used at the Clifton Bridge. So the bar chains were the same design as those made for Clifton. So he partners up with another fellow engineer, William Barlow, and they seek investors to finish the bridge as a memorial to their colleague, as well as removing the embarrassment to the engineering profession. Hawkshaw and Barlow made some significant changes to the deck, which increased the loading on the chains. And so to, to support this, an extra chain was added. So there was now three chains on each side. And work began again on site in 1862. Um, timber false work was erected against the towers and the saddles, which would eventually hold the three chains. And nine wrought iron cables were used to cross the gorge to make a jungle bridge, six for the bridge with stout planks uh, bound to them, two for the handrails, which also formed tracks for the grooved wheels of the cradles to support the bar chains during assembly and one to support the chains. And the chain links were basically brought in piece by piece and bolted together. So the chains containing 4,200 links were completed in 1864. And the deck was complete, was constructed by working from both sides. So you had iron hangers from the chains were bolted to the rods, which in turn then connected to the longitudinal girder. And then that in turn ran, which ran the full end of the bridge. And then they had, um, um, each rod to, to, to um, simplify replacement was attached to one of the three chains. So you had one rod going to the top, one to the middle, one to the, third, to the lower one, and then um, repeat itself. The wrought iron logged and longitudinal girders were one of the significant design changes made by Hawkshaw and Barlow. They replaced Brunel's proposed timber truss deck structure. Um, iron lattice girder, cross girders then were um, attached to the longitudinal girder and they contributed to the stiffness and strength. And another change to the, um, another change to the design uh, was, was the actual deck as well. The road deck now had um, two layers of Douglas fir planking at right angles to each other. A tramway, a tramway was installed to get the deck sections into place, which you can see in this picture. And this was the final stages of the construction with the finished toll houses, as you can see, just being um, finished up in the background. 
before opening the Board of Trade carried out a safety test um, and 500 tonnes of stone were spread evenly over the deck and the deck sagged by seven inches but uh, returned to its former level with the, when the stone was removed. So the, the inspectors declared it satisfactory. So that was our engineering test done and complete. And then there was a grand opening on the 8th of December in 1864. It wasn't quite finished. Um, the uh, cast iron cap, the cap on the Leeward Tower on the very left-hand side of your picture uh, wasn't in place. And there were some materials they were left over and they were all hidden under the large grandstand. But by now it was no longer the longest suspension bridge in the world. But after 110 years, William Vick, our wine merchant's dream did come true. So that's how the bridge was built. Um, and now I'll take you through um, where we are 155 years on. So it still remains the enduring icon of Bristol, but it obviously needs um, to be um, operational, it needs regular inspections, monitoring and maintenance required. So I'm just going to take you through now um, more about the, the current state of affairs and what we do. So these are the Briggs chains. Um, it's regularly inspected. Uh, we have a full, a full inspection every three years, but we do uh, every year we do bits of that um, inspection um, over the three year period. And then we get a triennial certificate uh, produced by our consultants. So this, this photograph shows how it used to be inspected. <clears throat> um, note the tweed PPE um, and the lack of any harnesses or ropes. Um, and this photo actually it wasn't them inspecting, but the inspectors did the same thing. This was them changing the light bulbs, which ran up each suspension road, road um, and the inspections would have been carried out the same way. Nowadays, our consultants, Covey, use much more suitable access arrangements when inspecting the chains. Um, and as the bridge is only a four ton weight limit, when we do uh, inspections, we have to shut the bridge, close the road um, and allow the inspections to carry on without uh, traffic. Um, but as it is a visitor attraction, even with the road closed, we always maintain a footway access um, across the bridge at all times. So that there's three chains on each side of the deck and they're situated one on top of each other. And this is a section looking through the chains. So you can see there, there's 11 or 12 links in each chain held together by a pin. And then the hanger straps either pass through the middle chain, the lower chain or the upper chain. Um, and they vary as they go along through across the deck. And this, this can be, um, this is the bane of my life because trying to paint, as you can see there, that middle chain is very difficult. Um, it's like painting behind the back of your radiator. So everything has to be done by hand. Um, and we did some paint trials in 2017 to see whether we could, um, you know, change our type of painting. Um, that wasn't quite successful as we hoped, but we are now getting ourselves geared up for a big painting contract um, in 2023. The chains are then attached, uh, they, they, they go over the bridge, they attach to the saddles at the top of the towers. Again, uh, these are second hand, they also came from um, Hungerford Bridge. So although the bridge is 155 years old, uh, the saddles again are much older than that. And these are the saddles, you can sort of see them here. They sit on 25 rollers, uh, which provide longitudinal movement. Um, and they, the, the rollers actually accommodate the changes in live load, um, usually from, and also changes in the temperature of the chains. Um, and to make sure, this is quite a key area because really we have to make sure that the, these rollers never seize up or they would put unnecessary forces into the anchorages, which could potentially cause issues. So we have, um, we have a series of monitoring um, on, the, on the actual towers. Um, so we have um, displacement monitors that are set up and they make sure that they, they then go back to a computer to tell us whether, whether there's any problems with the um, movement of the saddles. And really we want to know if the saddles actually stop moving. But we have regular um, inspection and maintenance in place to make sure that doesn't happen. So this is us, oh, this is one of our engineers, Covey engineers inspecting the rollers to make sure there's no corrosion or dirt in place there. And that's carried out by an endoscope. And then we put a perspex as a plate across the front of those rollers to make sure no dirt gets in after the inspection is carried out. And then the, after that, the chains carry on down into the um, fixed anchorages and they're, they are 20 feet below, 20 meters below ground level. 
and they were strengthened in 1925 and 1939. So here we have it getting tested, getting strengthened. Um, in, I think this was done really by boring into the rock above, below, onto the side with chains and putting the chains in and then filling it all up with concrete. Um, and the Clifton Anchorages was done similar. So the, the Lee Ridge one was done in 1925 and then the Clifton one was done in 1939. Um, and as, as you can see, um, once again, you can notice the lack of any sort of safety in terms of doing that. So we carry out regular inspection of the anchorages and the inclined shafts are fairly easy to inspect as their access st steps down to the bottom of the anchorages. Um, however, the vertical anchorages are not so easy. Uh, you have to shut the road and then basically get somebody to be dangled on a, on a winch um, till they get to the bottom. So 20 meters down and they get to the bottom and that's what you see. So these are our anchorage pieces. As you can see, this is just, that's, you can see two of the chains that are coming through um, and then being pinned against the plate. And then there'll be a third, there's a third uh, chain uh, outside the picture. So that's the chains and the anchorages. And then the deck itself is supported uh, from the chains by a series of hangers. And these have undergone a series of refurbishment over the past years from 2009 onwards. And the reason for this is this. So in 2009, we had this short hangar failure. Um, remember the public was walking past and said, is that the way it should be? Um, and of course, a lot of consternation at the time, the bridge was closed um, and we had to do some very quick, well, my, my colleague had to do, um, had to call in the engineers to see what had happened. And so what it is, is the, the, um, the hangers connect the deck to the suspension chains. And you have, um, you have a lower eye, then you've got a bottle screw, then you've got a solid rug, and then you've got an upper eye. And they should be pinned so that they should be able to move. Um, and they're all formed from wrought iron and they're designed to work as a single pin tension element. So, um, but unfortunately they uh, corroded um, within the pins and therefore they became fixed. And then we had fatigue and it, um, it caused the, um, the, the, the actual law to break. So um, a lot of work, as you can see here, that's how it broke. It was a very slow process, um, but um, over the years, uh, corrosion got in there and, um, and then it, it did break um, the last thread there. So that caused us to um, go through a whole series of um, inspection, um, really looking at the middle third, which was the, the key areas where we get the most movement. Um, and we did a lot of it. So we inspected it all. We had experienced um, NDT inspectors come in. We carried out MPI inspections on them. Uh, some, we find some cracks, um, some which were, some of them were minor, so they could be sort of, um, sort of uh, grinded up, ground out on others. We needed some replacement of the actual hangers. And every hanger was tested for articulation. So you can see here, this is what the, what the problem had been. The corrosion there on the mating services had led to that complete loss of articulation. And um, out of the 162 hangers, um, seven, were, um, seven were replaced. So um, we're carrying on with that. I mean, we've now done the majority of them, but there's still, um, it's still a slow process. So this is us in um, 2009 replacing one of the, the hangers. Um, their replacements are, um, they're not obviously replaced in wrought iron. So the replacements are put back in with steel, but great care is taken to sort of replicate the whole form and dimensions of the original. So um, I don't think if you were as a passerby were crossing the bridge, you'd actually know which one was steel and which one was wrought iron. So the um, bridge deck then is supported from these hangers onto the, um, on, is supported from these hangers. And as previously mentioned, it, can, it consists of, the, the bridge deck consists of two longitudinal girders that run the full length of the bridge. And then um, they separate the road actually from the footway. And then beneath that, the, the, the transverse girders are bolted at right angles um, and they provide the rigidity, rigidity for the deck. But, um, so we need to paint all of that. So all of that metalwork is painted and that's carried out using an uh, under deck uh, gantry. Um, it's very Victorian, it's hand propelled. So um, no, no machinery or anything like that, but we need two people, one at each side of the, of the, uh, of the deck. 
and they basically wind the gantry from one side to the other, which um, is quite strenuous if you're doing it, if you have to go from one, you know, do it in one full pass. Um, this is the deck underneath. So as you can see, quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of painting would be required. And in 1955, uh, this is how the painting was carried out. And you can notice the open flame behind the standing uh, painter as well. So uh, quite risky at times. And we just finished our under deck painting in 2017. So similar photograph, um, slightly different. We've now got um, uh, PPE on and we've now got sort of um, areas to stop the paint actually getting down into the, the gorge below. And then in 2012, we carried out refurbishment of the actual stonework on the two abutments. And um, this was a major en engineering feat in itself and getting the, the scaffolding up there. Um, and hopefully we won't have to do that very often. So cleaning and repairs of the stonework was carried out. Um, and as, this, as I said, because the bridge is grade one listed, um, great care has to be taken and a lot of in involvement with the conservation uh, engineers and our planners and historic England. And then in 2015, we carried on the refurbishment into the tower and again, um, repaired some of the stonework um, and uh, cleaned all the stone. And then recently, um, another project we did in 2019, I was very lucky to install contactless um, at our toll barriers. It's not an engineering feat, but it was very timely um, just before COVID broke out. So we were very lucky and um, it was just luck rather than um, foresight, but I'm glad we got it in, in, in advance of, of COVID. So that's the projects we've done. Our ongoing projects, we've still got quite a few to do. Um, and um, what we'd like to know is look at the unknowns that we have on the bridge. And one of the unknowns that we have is the stability of the rocks that the tower sits on. You know, we've got our bridge sits over a very high gorge. Um, and along the gorge, a lot of the rock has been bolted back over the years. So we needed to check whether our where the tower was was a was a rock below that fine. So we did major 3D analysis carried out by Geodesign to confirm the uh, situation of the rocks. Um, and we find that they are stable under the loads imposed by the bridge deck, but they may not be up to the full design factor safety for, today co for today's codes, but they are satisfactory for, for, for what we have on the bridge. So no major strengthening is required, but what is, going, is recommended by a consultant is that we need to clear the vegetation on the actual rock face to make sure that we don't get any um, further uh, rock fall. Um, and we're going to carry out some dentition work and some rock bolting, which is carrying out, which is being carried out at the minute. So the rock bolting will be installing 23, 27 mil diameter rock bolts, about four to five meters in length. Um, and these will prevent any of the parallel joints from sort of falling away from the actual rock face, like you know, books on a bookshelf. So they'll be, they'll be um, embedded into the rock and, and they'll stop that. And we also were going to fill in some of our larger cracks or larger fissures um, with dentition. So again, there'll be some uh, cementitious grout added to them and that'll stop any materials getting, um, any water getting in there, you know, freeze the action, um, allowing more, more, more cracks to occur. So this is um, ongoing at the minute. It's the gorge is a site of special scientific interest as well. So we've had a botanist and ecologist on, on site as well um, to make sure everything we do, we don't harm any of the raw rare plants that are um, abundant on the gorge. And then, as I said, the next big project after that is the chain. We call it the chain refurbishment project, but actually when we look at it now, it's more like a bridge refurbishment contract. Um, we're going to be painting the chains, um, we're going to be painting the parapet fence, um, and then to do the painting of the chains, we obviously need access platforms, so that needs to be designed into our projects, and also uh, we want to maintain the, the traffic going across the bridge as much as possible, because that's our, our only source of income, so we can't just shut the bridge, scaffold it all up, you know, and paint it, we need to keep the, the traffic moving at the same time. And then before we can paint, we have lights on the bridge, so they all need to come off. Um, and because they're 18 years old, we thought, well, now's a good time to look at our lighting. We've just got white LEDs at the minute. Um, and so we're going to look at that as well and see whether we want to, where we will upgrade our lighting and whether we put in coloured lights or, or all of that. Um, we, need to, we need to look at that as well. Um, as, as it's listed, that will all have to go through our planners on both sides of the gorge. It'll have to go through Historic England, consultations with the public. So it's a long process. So we hope to be ready to move on that. 
uh, by 2023. And also as well as that, we have our archives. So we like to maintain our archives. Some of those photographs you saw are from our archives. And this, this picture here is actually a collection of Victorian stereoscopes we have, which were gifted to us. Um, and so we are looking to house, at the minute our, our archives are housed off site. Um, and we'd like to actually have them installed um, in, in the actual um, footprint of the building um, so that we can actually show them to our, to our visitors as well. So those are a number of our, our projects. Um, it's a quick run through. I think I've gone a bit faster than I thought, but um, that's a quick run through the history and the life of the bridge. Um, and thank you for listening. And um, if there's any questions now or anything you want to ask me, then uh, let me know. Thank you very much, Trish, for that. That was an excellent presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, so, yeah, we do have some questions coming in there now. So just maybe a quick reminder to everybody, if you do want to get any questions in, to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So uh, the first question we got here is from Paul. And he's asked, uh, "Have did the Sphinxes ever make it to the top of the towers? Um, no, that no. Sadly, they didn't. Um, the the problem was Brunel was really um, even well, even Smith and um, even Hawkshaw and Barlow when they were building it, they had to look at, at cost savings, um, like all projects. So the uh, Sphinxes went went out with the cost savings, as did the um, the they were going to have sort of. Um, all ornate detail about how the bridge was going to be constructed along the towers, which would have been lovely and it'd be great for promoting engineering in the future. But again, they also um, they also had to be uh, shelved. All right, thank you very much for that, Trish. Uh, the next question is uh, regarding kind of consent. It is a grade one listed building or structure. Yeah. And did you have much difficulty in achieving consents for the use of modern materials? Uh, yes, we have our one of our more recent projects, which I didn't I didn't include, was the building of um, some new toll houses, and the old toll houses were there from the I mean not the Victorian the Victorian toll houses were the, the little tiny ones, and they're they're still in place on one side of the bridge, but we have toll houses for our we're a man bridge it's man twenty four hours a day by bridge attendants, and um, so we have toll houses for each of them. Um, on each side of the bridge. So we decided to rebuild them. They were not fit for purpose. They were getting you know, too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. So we rebuilt them. And um, we had lots of problems in just deciding what stone to use uh, to the extent where we had to actually build uh, a couple of stone um, walls nearly in our yard for the, um, for the planners to come in and decide what type of stone was more suitable. And we nearly were talking about hand picking it from various seams within the quarry uh, to get the right color of, um, of stone. So it, it is always a challenge with our, um, you know, when we have to do that. Um, but it, there are certain things we do. I mean, we, we replace the articulation spans, which are the spans that, that sort of span between the, the fixed end, the abutment basically on the deck. So it allows that little bit of movement. And they were, timber and they were rotten and they sunk and every time pedestrians would walk on it they couldn't fall through but you know there would be that wobble and that and it was a tripping hazard so we did put in steel under for that and we put it as a health and safety requirement that it had to be steel and uh, and we could we could get away with that thank you very much uh the next question is from patrick and has asked is the underbridge gantry still hand operated and if so, <laughs> uh, what was the reason it wasn't converted to machine operated? Well, the gantry is about 20 years old. So there was one, there was, there's was. there been ones before then. So there was one before then, which was, um, it did have a motor on it and it skewed and it caused some damage to the actual uh, power pit stanchions, which are on the outside of the, of the deck. Um, and it, it caused a lot of damage because it seems to skew. And I think after that, the, uh, the trust got nervous really about anything motorized. Um, and so they resorted back because it is a 200 meter span. So it's, it's not huge for a, a gantry to cross that. Um, so they then 20 years ago decided, no, we're going to go back to a hand propelled uh, gantry. Um, and it also reduces the whole maintenance side of things as well. Um, and you know that you're never going to um, skew it when you're when you're going across the bridge. It's, it goes across so slowly, um, and it seemed to be in keeping with the sort of Victorian type of, uh, of of qualities that we have here at the bridge. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, next question is from John, and he's asked about the inspections. Like, um, have you, is there any kind of modern or innovative use of inspection techniques on the bridge? Um, well, we've obviously, this year, we've actually used drones for the first time. So uh, the large uh, abutment on the leeward side, the big sort of uh, red sandstone abutment, um, it's very difficult to get to. So we used, we used drones for that um, to see what, you know, see how, what the state of the, um, the, 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 the stonework was in. So that was quite good. Um, and then, you know, just uh, we use modern sort of um, in terms of uh, NDT, MPI, um, ultrasonic types of testing really to, to make sure that, you know, to do the testing on the, on the rods and, and the various chain links and things like that. Thank you. Um, actually, I, there's no more questions sitting there at the moment, but we might just give people another minute or two to uh, get their lay questions in there. But um, obviously, maybe a question for myself. Obviously, you mentioned uh, finances is it's, it's purely the, the toll, uh, the, the one pound toll each way is how, how uh, you um, are able to pay for all your refurbishment projects. So uh, how, how far in advance can you kind of plan those works uh, or is it a is it a very steady stream of money that you come through? I mean, year? it's it's well, it was pre-COVID. Um, it, it was a steady stream of money. We were getting probably between three and four million a year, um, and and then we've got we do have a reserve fund as well. So should should there be some major problems with the the bridge or um, that we have to that we have to cover, say we have to close the bridge and and you know like a rod like the rod snapped. Um, then we do have a, a reserve fund just purely for for that sort of um, for emergencies really. Um, so we we've been okay, and particularly with COVID, you know, we may have had to we may have to dip into that reserve fund because you know obviously there was quite a, a time when we had no income coming in really with them um, with you know everybody on lockdown. So, but it, we we tend to it's not the the money. Yes, we do have to plan our projects in line with the funding, but it's more in, in line with trying to just get as how many projects you can have on the bridge at one time. You know, it is a small span. It's 200 meters wide long and, uh, you know, we've got footways each side. So we can, if we're replacing hangers on one side, we have to keep the other footway open. So we tend to try and do sort of one project at a time. Otherwise, um, you know, we're really struggling with terms of access for pedestrians and for motorists. Um, so, so yeah, so we're, we're okay at the minute with our funding. We had a, an increase in our toll in, from 50p to a pound, probably about, it must have been about 10, 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, and we allowed at that time for the various projects. So I think we should be okay um, for these various projects going forward for a wee while yet. And is that within your role as bridge master, within your remit to uh, adjust the charge as you see fit? Uh, it's a, the bridge, the toll of the, the toll part of the bridge is an act of parliament. So um, anytime you want to change it, it is a massive, a massive bit of work. You've basically got to, you know, you've got to get everything together, all the information, and then it has to be approved by parliament. So it's a very costly and time consuming um, thing to do. And so therefore we try not to do it very often. So although we went from 50p to a pound, we sort of said, well, you know, that's a big jump, but it means that we won't have to do it um, for a, a long period of time. We do have concession cards as well, which means you can cross cheaper and we have we have a bit of flexibility on those. We can change the price of those because they're below the one pound threshold. Thank you. Uh, some more technical questions have come through now. So Marty has asked, how were the original chains anchored to the rock abutments? So you've got, um, it's hard to see there, but they, they are, the chains that are, they are well, how they're anchored is, is basically as they are now. So basically the, the chains go form right down into the, into the uh, longitude or the inclined shafts. There's a big plate and they link through the plate and then there's a pin that goes through the back of the, of the links. So you've, and you saw that picture when I showed you uh, the big plate um, and you can see then the chains sort of linked into that. And then that's the, and then on top of that, they were worried about the whole, whether the anchorage were sufficient enough. So then they put chains across the links as well. So they tied the, the chains back to the rock and they bolted that in. And then on top of all of that, they poured the concrete. So, you know, they made it like nearly like a cork in a, in a bottle, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't go out. 
Um, but we did some an analysis on the existing anchorage before they did all this strengthening in the in the, the, the 50s. And actually what they have as the existing anchorage is sufficient um, for the for the bridge. Because you have to remember we we only have a four ton weight limit as well on the bridge. It's not um, you know lorries as well. And so that the analysis showed that they didn't actually need that extra strengthening, which is good for us. So it's a bit more belt and braces. Absolutely. And uh, the last question I have here is from Finbar, and he has asked, how complicated was it, sorry, how complicated was it to remove vegetation from the exposed rock surface, protect the rock in the protected landscape? Yeah, um, yes. So what we had to do was we had to uh, have our um, ecologist um, who from Nats, we, we, we've got permission from Natural England because they look after all the, the, the that side of the rock face and the plants. And then we had an ecologist, we put her down on the ropes with uh, our, um, our roped access guys. Um, she's a good climber anyway, that's what she's used to. And then she was able to highlight certain areas that could be cleared and certain areas that couldn't be cleared. And luckily there are lots of rare plants on the gorge and they think a lot of them has come from the old ships that used to go up and down the gorge years ago and um, from various countries and you know seeds have been sort of you know scattered and, and the like so we do have quite a few rare, rare plants but um, most of them seem to be sort of off the, that rock face uh, because that's sort of hidden underneath the bridge so it's hidden from light and sun so it doesn't get the, the best the best areas for plants so, but yeah, we used to, we have to have her on site, um, and so she 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 checks exactly where we can remove the vegetation. Thank you. Um, that does appear to be the last of the questions that are sitting there. Um, so, unless there is anything else about to come in in the next few seconds, which I don't think there seems to be, I'd just like to thank you, Trish, for that excellent presentation. It was a really really good one. I uh, totally enjoyed it. And hopefully I get over there to visit it some of these days soon as well. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah definitely need to get over there. And um, yeah, just thanks again from everybody in the GB region. And uh, without any further ado, I think I'll call this to an end. So thanks everybody Thank for you. attending and hopefully see you at some events soon.